Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We are continuing our study in Matthew chapter 24. We're calling this the Days of Tribulation. And, you know, I kind of figured that last week's Watchman broadcast on this subject would generate a little bit of controversy. And it has. And I was prepared for that. And I tried to answer um, the, the questions that some people had, the objections that some people had as best as I could using the scripture. And my challenge was last week, as it is this week, that if you don't agree with anything I say, then send me the scriptures that say that I'm wrong. I, again, don't ask me to read a bunch of books and send me stacks of them and, or call me names, because that really was, that won't get you anywhere. Send me the scriptures that show that I'm wrong. And the idea is, is that Jesus is referring to a time of tribulation. He mentions it twice in Matthew chapter 24. And if you follow the text, again, let me, let me kind of say it like this. If you had never read any books on Bible prophecy, and you'd never watched any of Jack Van Impey, you'd never watched um, any prophecy in the news, anything like that, and you were coming to the Bible with a brand new, fresh mind, you, you never knew anything, and you were reading Matthew 24, you would never read this and say, well, that's obviously not for us, that's for the Jews, and the tribulation lasts seven years. You would never read that, or you'd never think that, because you didn't read it in the text anywhere. And that's my point. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus mentions immediately after the tribulation of those days, he then talks about the sign of the Son of Man appearing in the clouds, which is exactly where Paul told us that he would be. It's where the angels in the book of Acts told the disciples, that's where he'll be. He'll be coming in the clouds and we're going to meet him there. So that's the, the premise that I'm taking, is that since I cannot find any reference in the Bible to the fact that there is a seven-year tribulation, then I must not believe that there is a seven-year tribulation. There are days of tribulation. And what we're going to do today we're going to move on from that argument. We're going to look at, and I encourage you to do this. We're not going to look at every single place in the Bible where the word tribulation or tribulations is used. That doesn't mean I'm hiding something. I would encourage you to do the same thing. Get the Pure Bible Search software or get your favorite concordance or read every word in the Bible and underline every time you find the word tribulation and do your own study and ask yourself this, ask yourself this one question. Is it possible that God's church, us born again, Bible believing Christians, is it even possible that we go through any tribulation? That's the question to ask. So let's start it with Matthew chapter 24. Then we're going to go back to the Old Testament. There are a few references in the Old Testament to the word tribulation. We'll look at those. Then we'll look at the rest of them in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. And that's an event that he said was going to mark the end of the tribulation of those days. Once God is done with the, that tribulation, then we're going to know it. 
because the sun's going to be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from the heavens, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Again, we're going to study that after we're done with this tribulation thing. We're going to study that event. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So here's what I'm seeing in scriptures. Since the word tribulation is linked with the word trouble, and we'll see that. I'm not just making that up. We'll actually see it mentioned in the Bible. Tribulation and trouble. You could say troublation, maybe. But after that time of tribulation, God's saints have been tried. They've been troubled. Tribulation has occurred. We're now ready to look for Jesus to appear in the air. And I'm not trying to be critical of every Christian for every reason. But to be honest with you, there are some days where things are fine and dandy and we're well fed and we've got money in the bank and everybody loves us and we're not really looking for Jesus to appear in the air and ruin all of that, right? But when days hit us that are very troubling, days hit us where we're frightened out of our minds, terror has taken hold of us, those are the days when we look up and say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. The next verse we're going to go to is in the book of Deuteronomy, and God nails it. God knows, I mean, God knows Israel, God knows us, and to think that there's any significant difference between the Israelite and a Gentile, Paul tells us in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that the things that befell Israel in the wilderness are examples to us. Paul mentions um, that they all drank of the same spiritual drink, which was Christ. They all ate of the same spiritual bread that we eat from. With many of them, God was not well pleased. And he says, these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So the apostle Paul mentions about how God struck them down for this and God killed a bunch of them for that. And he tells us, lest we swell up with pride and think, well, that's not going to happen to us because we're the Gentiles and that was for the Jews. Paul said, take heed lest ye fall. After the same example that the Israelites fell by, doing the same thing. Is it possible that Gentiles can commit the same sins that the Israelites committed? Absolutely. So read 1 Corinthians 10, all of it, and you'll find out that the way that God dealt with Israel was an example of how he's going to deal with us and when it comes to Jew or Greek, there's no difference, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 25, and here's what I mean by that. God says, when thou shalt beget children and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image, or the likeness of anything, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. Let me stop right here. I have this little theory when he says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, that that goes along with um, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, you remember, is where that verse is taken out of all the other modern translations except the King James. 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. So in these two verses, you have heaven and earth witnessing together. You have three in heaven, and you have three in earth bearing witness together. And God says here, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. 
So if you take out 1 John 5, 7, you've taken out half the witness. And how is it that you can accuse somebody of something except it be by at the mouth of two or three witnesses? Anyway, back to the text. Verse 26, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto you go over Jordan to possess it. You shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed, and the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathen. And whether the Lord shall lead you, and there ye shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. How many people since, I don't know, let's say since the 60s in this country, have left and gone like to India or to some place in Asia, to some ashram or some Tibetan monk monastery to worship gods of stone. How many people, how much of that junk has come over into this country and caused our nation? And do you think it's possible that God could take the people of our country because of our sins put us in bondage, and then scatter us out all over the heathen nations? You think that's pop? Did God do it to Israel? Let him that think he standeth take heed lest he fall. Verse 29, But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thine heart and with all thy soul. When thou art in tribulation, not the tribulation, not the great tribulation, not the seven-year tribulation, when thou art in tribulation. And all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, look at there, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shall be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he sware unto them. Now, according to some, in the days of tribulation, there's no Holy Spirit anywhere on the earth, so people can't get convicted, and people can't get saved, even though some people say they're tribulation saints. But right here, clearly, God says, when you are in tribulation, even in the latter days, if you turn to the Lord your God and be obedient to his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he swear unto them. Now, I do believe that there will come a time after the tribulation of those days where God, it's like when he shut the door of the ark. You obviously had people on the outside beating on it as the waters rose. But God already shut the door. And though they beat and scream and waste away in that water, they had their chance, and God wasn't going to listen ever again. And so the purpose of God bringing people into tribulation is to get them to cry unto God. I mean, think about when you got saved. When you got saved, was life going well for you and you were a very happy, very content, very at peace person and then just decided one day that you would wake up and change your religion? No. Usually it was at a time when you were so bad you couldn't stand yourself. And it seemed like the full weight of heaven and hell were on you, and you couldn't stand it anymore. And God, Jesus, knocked on your door, and you answered and said, Jesus, come into my life. That's what he's saying here, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Judges chapter 10 little bit similar situation. 
And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, this is Judges 10, verse 10, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites, from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines, the Zidonians also, and the Malachites and the Maonites, did oppress you, and you cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand? Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods, wherefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord, and his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Now this is twice now, and these are the first two mentions of the word tribulation or tribulations in the King James Bible. And both of them have to do with a sinful people. So let's, let's take this now and apply this to 21st century churchianity. Because in the times that we're living in right now, the churches, let's say of America, Kenya, Australia, England, anywhere Christianity is, more than likely they are corrupt there isn't a single denomination or ministry that isn't dealing with some form of doctrinal or morality problem. Serious doctrinal or morality problems. Occult practices moving in to churches. People are actually going to church and serving other gods, like in the form of statues, or where they're doing the yoga class in church, or whatever it is, or the immoral, the gross immorality. A pastor doing threesomes with his wife and another guy ended up getting shot in the head in his own bed by his own gun. That kind of stuff. Let me just tell you what leads up to that kind of stuff. What leads up to that kind of stuff is pastors who have too much time on their hands, who are probably downloading their sermons from some company that's writing them for them so they don't have to study much during the week. They're not in the Word of God more than likely they're on their laptop all week long should i say any more that's the kind of stuff that god sees going on in this country and i promise you he will send troubling times and during those troubling times those who really love the Lord, those who really love Jesus. And this is why I, I try to tell people, you know, you know people that are using other Bibles and they're going to these churches or they're doing all this stuff. Don't give up on them. Don't just quit and call them heretics and make enemies out of them. Because who's to say that when God brings troubling times to this world, that these same people begin to fear the Lord. And remember, that's one of the seven spirits of God. And that time of tribulation pulls them away from their sins and their false gods and their lazy attitude toward prayer, toward Bible reading, toward the service of the Lord, their lazy attitude about that all of a sudden changes because they get fear in their heart. Listen, I know all about this because I've had it happen to me. When God dealt with me and God got a hold of me, he scared me to death. 
I thought I was going to lose my life. And I didn't want that to happen. So God changed me using tribulation. Now we have two witnesses. Deuteronomy chapter 4, Judges chapter 10, and in both of them. And I like how God puts this. When tribulation happens, go and cry to other your gods and see if they can bring you out of this tribulation. They won't. And God knows that his real people, instead of crying to Baal, are going to cry to Jehovah God. And God's going to be merciful to them, and he's going to save them, just like he did all through the book of Judges. Mm. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 19. He said, And ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your, and this is a word now, he associates with tribulations, adversities, and your tribulations. Now, we have, we have some people who defend the seven-year tribulation so much that they claim that tribulation is the wrath of God. Tribulation is God's wrath. They claim that even though there's no verses whatsoever. Tribulation, however, is more associated with things like trouble, which we'll see, adversity, which we see right here. He saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations. And notice, see, when it's time to pour out God's wrath on this earth, nobody's going to be saved. Nobody is. When God finally gets to the point to where his wrath is coming down, people are going to be screaming, God, we're sorry. And God says, can't hear you which is what he did in the days of Noah, which is what he did in the days of Lot. Oh, I'm sure as they see big sulfur fireballs coming down from heaven that now they're sorry, but it's too late. And God's not listening. Even Lot's wife, who made a pretense of coming out of Sodom, who turned her back and faced Sodom, turned into a pillar of salt. You see, during the wrath of God, there's no more time left for salvation. But during tribulation, there is. That's the difference. That's what I'm seeing clearly from the Bible. Who himself saved you out of all your adverse adversities and your tribulations, and ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. And in 1 Samuel 26, 24, And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. How many verses now have we seen? Let's see here. We've seen Deuteronomy 4, Judges 10, 1 Samuel 10, 1 Samuel 26. And so far, all four of those verses has God delivering his people out of that tribulation. Whatever tribulation it was, God was delivering them out of it. Not necessarily before it happened, while it was happening, or after it happened. God delivered them out of it of it. That's, that's the difference between reading Clarence Larkin and all the other hundreds of books. And I, I had somebody offer to send me book after book after book after book on dispensationalism so that I would end up believing it. And I said, no, you can keep them. And then they made a big stink about it. I offered to educate him. I offered to send him books. He refused to believe it. He refused to read it. That's exactly right. And I always, unless I want to study it to say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. 
because I'm not required to read those books. I'm required to read this one, which obviously some people when it comes to tribulation never bothered to study what God said about it. Or at least they would have questioned it. Now, Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, we have um, a, a parable that God used literally to establish my thoughts on salvation. And who's saved, who isn't. And it's the parable of the seed and the sower. My fingers are dry this morning. I can't turn the pages of my Bible. The parable of the seed and the sower. God directed me to that one day, and I'm reading it. And here's what's interesting about it. The Bible says that this is Jesus teaching them his doctrine in the form of the parables. So he teaches the parable, and all the Jews sitting around are going, what does that even mean? When his disciples get with him, he says, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. But to them that were without, they'll, they'll never figure it out. They'll never figure it out because they won't read it from Jesus. They won't hear it from Jesus, and, they won't, and they, they'll never understand it unless you get it from Jesus himself. And I remember I was going to go speak at a church on behalf of a, a certain ministry, and the church was going to open its doors and let me, you know, use that. They, I was going to be filmed there. And the pastor called me and wanted to know what my doctrinal statement was before he let me. And I can understand that. He asked me what I believe about salvation. So I began to describe to him. And I said, and actually I said, I got this from the parable of the seed and the sower. And I explained to him what I meant by that. And he said this. Well, I don't get any of my doctrine from the parables. What? And it was then that I was introduced for the very first time, probably a hyper dispensationalist who excludes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation from any doctrine whatsoever. They exclude all of those books as having any doctrinal merit for us in this age, this dispensation right now. And I figured out why. It's because their doctrine doesn't match what's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Doesn't match, doesn't match any of that. In fact, it contradicts that. So like I said, the easiest way when your doctrine contradicts the Bible is you figure out some way of excising the Bible and removing it so that now your doctrine remains steadfast. And it's like I've said, you can either conform your doctrine to the Bible or, which is much easier for people, you can conform the Bible to your doctrine. That way you're never wrong about anything. That pastor was dismissed not too long after that because they found him embezzling all thousands of dollars from the church. Because after all, thou shalt not steal. Well, that's for Israel in the Old Testament. True story. So in Matthew 13, he gives the parable of the seed and the sower. And here's what I find interesting about it. Four groups, you know, the number four is for the gospel, right? Four groups have access to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of God, the good word of God. And only one of those groups produce fruit and make it to heaven. The rest of them don't. 
So we know the story. The, the sower goes out to sow. Some falls by the wayside and the fowls are there to pick it up. Some fall among stony ground and it grows for a little while, endures for a little while, but when the sun comes out and heats it up, it has no root and it dies off before it can ever produce fruit. Then some is sown among thorns and the thorns choke out, you know, the, the, the thorny weeds choke out the plants and keep sunlight from hitting it and it dies before it bears fruit. But then some was sown among good ground and some of that bear 30, some 60, some 100. And upon reading that, I decided, you know, it doesn't really matter to us how big our church is. God is the one who's in charge of that. Amen? And then number two, it dawned on me that that fourth group, they were destined. You could say predestined to bring forth much fruit. And they were never not going to heaven. Amen? So, let's look at it now. Jesus' explanation of those groups now and how he describes what happens to them when the word is sown in their lives. Matthew 13, verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one. See, he mentions earlier that they're the fowls of the air. Fowls, you know, they have wings, so they are like prints of the powers of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So my friend Tim Barron, standing out, handing 300 gospel tracts a day, every day, out in Lost Wages, Nevada, 99.98% of them gets thrown in the trash can because those people are in Sin City to do one thing, and that is sin as much as possible. And there's got so many devils on them, they're not going to read the gospel. They don't care. So when then the wicked cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when, what is that word? Tribulation or persecution ariseth, because of the word, by and by he is offended. So earlier we saw that tribulation was associated with affliction. Now we see also that tribulation is associated with persecution. And my friends, as bad as I hate to think this, because I'm a big chicken, the thought of being persecuted literally, like with pain and torture for my faith, doesn't thrill me to death. It scares me. But it's coming. And if I'm a big fake phony preacher who's only out after your money, then it'll be known. Because when the persecution takes place, I'm out of here. I'm not going to have that. And that's what that stony ground is. You know, it's a plant, it's a seed that falls on, you know, like the grass over my septic tank. I got a septic tank sitting behind my house, and the grass right now over the septic tank is as green as all the other grass in the world because we've had plenty of rain. Come August, when the rest of the grass can grow roots way down deep and still pull moisture out of the ground, the grass over my septic tank, which the dirt's only like this thick above it, I have this big brown rectangle in my backyard. Why? Because the grass has no root. It can pull up no moisture. It's not deep. 
Isn't that how it is with a lot of our church people? They just refuse to grow deep in the Word of God because part of the time they don't believe it anyway. So when persecution or affliction arises because of the Bible, they're out. And he specifically mentioned tribulation. Tribulation is going to do one of two things. It's either going to stabilize those who are really God's people or it's going to trouble them so much that they'll leave. And then there will be a clear difference between who is and who isn't. And then he said, verse 22, He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and becometh unfruitful. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, not brings forth his own fruit. He bears the fruit that the, that the vine gives it and bringeth forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Again, it doesn't matter how big your church is. Rick Warren made a big deal about that. The reason why you don't have anybody coming to your church, the reason why you only have thirty in your church, it's because you don't do this, and you don't play rock and roll music, and you don't have coffee shops, and you let them, you make them dress up, and all this nonsense that he made up. Well, who said that a thousand-member church is a righteous church to begin with? Who said that? God didn't. God said there could be just 30 people in there, but I'm the one who put the 30 in there better off that way, isn't it? Are you starting to get a different idea now of what tribulation is? And to think that the seven-year tribulation that they somehow came up with was all about God pouring out his violent, angry wrath upon all of those who are not saved. Does that sound like what he's doing here so far? No. Because the same tribulation or persecution that fell on the stony ground uh, people is the same tribulation that fell on the ones who bore fruit. It's just that they had roots in them deep enough to be able to endure that tribulation and that persecution. And they still bore fruit. Remember what, they, remember what they tried to do in Egypt to the Jews? They said they're having too many babies. Well, we'll stop them from that. We'll, uh, we'll work them so hard that when they get home at night, they're too tired to do anything except go to bed. Well, they were still growing. You can't stop God's people, devil. Can't do it. Now, Mark and Luke... Here's what they say in that same text, in that same passage concerning the stony ground. Mark said, they have no root in themselves and so endure for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake. So we have affliction and persecution, just like we've seen earlier. The Bible's double witnessing itself. Luke said, they on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy and these have no root and which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. And yes, I, I, I've seen it all throughout my life in church. People believe for a while. Then in time of temptation. So we have tribulation now associated with affliction, persecution, Temptation. The devil says, come back. I got a woman for you. Oh, she's hot. She'll give you whatever you want. Come back. I got, I got more money. I got a job waiting for you. It's easy job. In fact, it's a job that, like, you can make so much money, and people will do that. They'll leave. 
They'll walk out and they'll leave. Why? Because they only believed it for a little while. And then they quit. When the tribulation hit, when the persecution or the affliction hit, when the temptation came, they left. Mm. John chapter 16. Now, I, I love John 16. I love this chapter because it's full of the, the job of the Holy Ghost is to show us, is to be there with us when we're reading the Bible. And things that you don't know now, if you'll pray and you'll read the Bible and you'll ask God, God, show me great and mighty things that I know not, Boom, God will do it. I promise you he will. And he says this in this passage. I, I love this. John 16, 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. Ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned to joy. So think about what he's saying here. A time of weeping, lamentation. There's a whole book in the Bible. A lamentation. The, but the world's going to be having a party. Ye shall be sorrowful. It's a time of sorrow. But your sorrow shall be turned to joy. And he says this. Now, a woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour has come. Stop right here. Can you think of verses in the Bible, places in the Bible where the coming of the Lord is linked to a travailing woman. She is in travail, has sorrow because her hour has come, but as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice." and your joy no man taketh from you. Now, let's go to 1 Thessalonians. Let, in fact, let's, let's just open it up. Because first Thess I have 1 Thessalonians 5 up on the screen, but let's go to that book, 1 Thessalonians. Because there is a, a progression here. You're right. When I asked you the question, can you think of a place in the Bible where there's a travailing woman? And you said, yeah, when they shall say peace and safety. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. Yes. What is that in, remember, I always tell you, walk circumspectly. Think of that verse, go to that verse, and then read what's around that verse, why it's there. 1 Thessalonians 5, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. What does that come after? Look in 1 Thessalonians 4, the previous chapter, verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For you selves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So what is he telling us here? He's clearly telling us that before the Lord appears in the air, there is a time of travailing. The sorrows of a travailing woman. And isn't that what we just saw in John 16? And I haven't linked John 16 yet with tribulation. You didn't see the word tribulation in those verses yet. But they're coming. 
Verily, verily, I say unto you that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned to joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow, because her hour is come, but as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And then that equals 1 Thessalonians 5, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. Now if we were to keep reading in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, But ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly, certainly, during the time of wrath, no one is saved and escapes out of it. No one is. But of a time of travail, of sorrow, affliction, persecution, tribulation, yes, people are saved during that. And th those are the times, remember, when God is purifying his church, cleaning does not even our church, Bethel Church, need purifying. Will not our church, Bethel Church, be judged first? Because judgment begins at the house of God? Yes. And so, I believe that this time, these days of tribulation, are meant to get the saints on their knees where they belong, get them in the word where they belong, get them praying where they belong, doing the things that they should be doing. Instead of out living it up your best life now, God's going to give you the greatest super party ever if you just have enough faith and send Joel Osteen $4,000, $5,000, $50,000. Some of you can afford $500,000. The only one partying during that time is going to be Joel Olstein because he's got your $500,000 to do it with. So you see what I'm saying here? The time of tribulation is the time when God causes the people, some of the people that you pray for, that they get their heart right with God. It could very well be that during that time, I, I'll never forget this. I will never forget it. September 11th, 2001. A young lady that my wife and I have been praying for for years to get saved. September 11th, 2001, that night she called me, scared to death. Is this the end of the world? And I said, no, but I'm going to preach on this tomorrow night you know, if you remember, that was a Tuesday. I'm going to preach on this tomorrow night. And when I do, I'm going to give an invitation. And you can come and get saved. And she said, I'm not waiting till tomorrow night. I want to get saved tonight. You see what happened? Trouble troubling times, tribulation, sorrow. It had all of us on our knees at that time, didn't it? And isn't that the case where to get us on our knees, to get us really right with God, 
it takes persecution. It takes sorrow. It takes the, the troubling times in order for us to do that. Now, John, back in John 16, he mentions, you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned to joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Now, there's another verse in the Old Testament. Isaiah 13 says almost the same thing. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them, and they shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Notice in verse 10, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Notice that that is exactly... What Jesus said, Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. It's the same thing. So that when we go back to John 16 now, verse 32, here's what Jesus said. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So, the birthing of a baby. To, now, I can't pretend to know what that's even like. But I do remember what my wife went through with the four children that she gave birth to. And I remember the one night, you know, doctors nowadays, they like to plan the birth. Show up, Next Tuesday, 6.30 a.m., we'll hook you up. We'll start the process of the giving the medicine that makes you start having contractions. At some point, we'll break the bag of waters to, you know, bring this forth, and we'll get this thing done, you know, by about 4 o'clock. That way I can go home and rest and, you know, whatever. That, that they don't like those surprises, okay? Well, with our second daughter, my wife went into what they call a false labor. They sent her home. Nothing, you know, it's not going to happen now. And I don't remember the exact time frame, but we're sitting in the living room, just minding our own business, and all of a sudden, boom, my wife jumped up. <gasps> and I mean, we looked like the Keystone Cops. We were running around grabbing this, grabbing that, grabbing that, and rushing to the hospital. I made a one hour, it was a one hour trip from our house to the hospital she was going to give birth in. And I made that trip in like 28 minutes. I ran every red light. Yes, I did. I broke all the laws. I know I, I'm not having a baby in my car. Okay. The travailing woman there thing is for a reason. Isaiah 13, he mentions that travailing woman. You remember the days when Hophni and Phineas were killed. The sons of Eli and the Ark of the Covenant was taken. And Phineas's wife was about ready to give birth and she was travailing. And what happened? The man of sin, the son of perdition was born. The man called Ichabod, the glory has departed. You see, that's what I, I see that. I see the appearance of Ichabod as a type and a foreshadowing of the appearance of Christ in the air, and now the glory of good God is departed from off of this world, and God's going to start, after we leave, God's going to start pouring wrath down on this earth. And we have John 16, and a woman when she is in travail, and then we have 1 Thessalonians 
5, after the mentioning of the Lord appearing in the air, that when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon the earth as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And we have in Revelation, and I love this, I think there's a connection here, and it, and it has to do with the miracle of the language of the one translation of Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, I mean the King James Bible, in Revelation 12, we have a woman, a wonder. Remember, remember Peter said, and Joel said, there'd be wonders in the heavens. What we have right here, there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. I think that has everything to do with it. Then we have the other wonder in heaven where we have the great red dragon and he's ready to eat that baby as soon as it's born. Ooh. And then it says in verse five, and she brought forth a man child. That is exactly what Jesus said in John 16. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Why does it have to be a man? Because the man here is not just any man. That man is going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. What man is that? It's Jesus. And what happens? She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And that is exactly the same word used. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I think it's all tied together. And I think that time of tribulation doesn't last seven years. I don't even think it lasts three and a half years. So don't call me pre-trib, don't call me mid-trib, don't call me post-trib, just call me whatever you want to call me. I'm trying to make sense out of what this Bible is saying. And I think there is a period of tribulation that's coming. Can we endure it? Only if God is in us, if Christ is in us, and his word abides in us. And will it be rough? Yes. Will we have to hold on to God? No, he always holds on to us. And he will gently lead us through those times. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So, do I get a little worried about those days? Yeah. But as far as being afraid that I'm not going to make it, that choice has already been made by God. And I believe he will gently lead us through the sufferings and the sorrows that he has already been through and lead us into that land of promise to be with him caught up forever and forever. Now, I'm, I'm not done. I've got some pretty cool stuff with numbers to show you on this tribulation thing. You study it again for yourself. Study every place in the Bible where the word tribulation, tribulations. You can study persecution. You can study uh, travail. You can study sorrow. You can study trouble because they're all linked in with it. And I promise you that by doing those studies, number one, it will never be time wasted you will see things that probably you have never seen before, but it will answer questions that you've always asked. And all I'm asking any 
honest Bible believer who believes in a seven-year tribulation, all I'm asking you to do is go search the scriptures to see whether these things be true or not. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Isn't that fair enough? Rather than just calling me names and being angry with me, I think that's fair. God bless you. You're the reason why we do what we do. Pray for our ministries in Kenya. The Lord gives us great grace to do what we do and the devil aggravates us to death every time we do something over there and it's happening right now so pray for us as we minister amongst the good people of kenya and around the world god bless you i love you we'll see you next time bye bye